First of all, I, I, Mr. Ebert, I, we, I think, was it Monday we found out or Tuesday that we were going to be here Thursday? Anyway, so you kind of get the idea of, you know, so I want to apologize right to start with. So when you go home today and you say, phew, that was a, just a waste of an hour, I, I, want, I want to apologize in advance that you, you know, have wasted an hour to listen to us two ramble up here. But, uh, but uh, what we're going to share with you, hopefully, is uh, the Coast Guard, you know, has been a very important part of, you know, Shackleford Banks, Core Banks, this area. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, right. And a lot of people have made their living being in the Coast Guard. And with that said, you know, the, the ships that are around here, I did when I was, and I'm, I'm Chris Yeomans, by the way. If, see how we're rambling on here? I'm Chris Yeomans, by the way. I'm a retired school educator. Don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> And I've been retired now for about five, five and a half years. But when I was back in the teaching days, uh, I, and I, I hate to call it working because I did what we call the mule chain beach tours over with Sonny Williamson and Jenny. Some of y'all may know Mr. Sonny, Miss Jenny. And with that said, I'm, you might say, one of Sonny's protégés. I, I try to live up to his high expectations. So if some of y'all, I don't know if you were here with the Fish House Liar thing with Mr. Rodney Kemp. He and I did that together. Again, I'm trying to fill in some shoes, big shoes to fill in. So I'm trying to do that and, and, and keep that tradition going. I, I have, and, and when we get going, I have, this was kind of like our um, manual, you might say. And, and if you went over to the Cape, this went like play by play of the stops that we would go to. And there was some shipwrecks in here. So, you know, before the hour's over with, if Mr. Heber don't talk the whole time, uh, I'll share some <laughs> shipwrecks with you. Uh, this is, and see, I love this kind of stuff, but this is a book that Sonny wrote, and it's called Unsung Heroes of the Surf, and it's uh, basically dealing with the United States Lifesaving Service, which, which predates the Coast Guard. Same group of people. They just changed the name, okay? And the United States Lifesaving Service uh, was established around here right after the wreck of the Chrissy Wright, and some of you may have... Not that you were alive at that time, I'm not saying it, but you know, you may have heard about the Chrissy Wright and the being so cold and stuff. So, we may talk a little bit about that and the establishment of that. But this is, and I love this kind of stuff, actual documentation. He did a lot of research. I know Sonny was full of fish house lars. Matter of fact, one of his, you might say, um, sayings was never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's Sonny. So, anyway, but uh. But in here is, uh, you know, records. Uh, he's quoting uh, uh, diaries, uh, newspapers from the era. I mean, this is stuff that I just, and I was a history major, by the way. So this stuff really just, I think, is real exciting. I don't like, you know, what Daniel Steele, Land of the Lust books. I don't like those things. I like factual history stuff. But again, don't let you know, a story, you know, don't, anyway, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. So anyway, I, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to, because you've got a PowerPoint. You actually prepared today. Oh, this is my lighthouse thing. All right, so, uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Heber. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I uh, grew up on Harker's Island. Uh, my family did, and we are all uh, lived there kind of same neighborhood, but it seemed like growing up all around us was people in the Coast Guard. Uh, I know it seemed like back in the 50s and 60s when you graduated from high school, you went into branch of service. It was kind of automatic. My brother was in the Navy four years. Uh, my cousins, my uncle, he's, all those were Coast Guard people. Next door to us on the west end was Rasnell Lewis. He was a chief over to Cape Lookout, also here to Fort Macon. On the other side of me was uh, uh, Etheridge Davis. He was in a Coast Guard Reserve they had back then. Uh, so Coast Guard was all around us uh, as I was growing up. So I learned some of the lingo from the kids. Their parents was in the military. So I learned some of the lingo, the, I'll call it that, and some of the names they referred to uh, at growing up. Uh, Chris mentioned the... Uh, the uh, shipwreck of uh, the Christie Wright in 1886. Uh, prior to that, there was no rescue service on the banks, none. Only people that lived there. Uh, matter of fact, the, the wreck, the, the uh, Christie Wright, actually, 
who finally got to her was a whaling crew called a Red Oar Crew with Josephus and his five or six sons who finally got out there to her. So we had nothing out there to save people until that happened. And then like a year or two later, 1888, we get the, the life-saving service over on, uh, on Cape Lookout. Uh, uh, R.O. Lewis, you all down there especially know R.O. Lewis. Uh, I'll tell you this quick story because I want you to kind of see what he, what he, uh, some stuff he did and some stories. Uh, R. Lewis, uh, he he had to be he would be what 102. His birthday was yesterday. Was this was 2000. He was he was in it. He was 90 uh, when this happened. If you see right here, Pam, can you? Hey Pam. <laughs> oh, Scott. Perfect. Right on, Just right on the ball. Perfect. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, the Maritime Museum. I don't know where the contract or commission or whatever. But they got a job to build a surf boat that the life-saving people used to use. And Ara, he did that when he was in the Coast Guard. He trained other Coast Guard men and women to handle those surf boats. So Ara got involved with this. He could drive himself to Beaufort. He didn't need no help to get to Beaufort. Like I said, he was almost 90. He went back and forth to Beaufort to the Maritime Museum. And they probably got tired of Ara because he, would, he was the kind of... Uh, and I love his actions. He would get right up to me, and he would take his finger. And for some reason, when he talked, he wanted to touch my chest right here. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, he was this close, and I loved it. A lot of people go. I, I said, I love it. I want don't 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 say a thing about it. So uh, so anyway, uh, this was in not. You see the date here. It was in October. Uh, so they got the they got the vessel built, and about a week before this, Ira calls me one Sunday night. Said, Heber, I need your help. I said, Well, all right, what is it? You know, I didn't. He, he said, What is it? I said, He said, Well, he said, You know, they've got the surf boat built and they want us to row it in Taylor's Creek. And so, what they did, Beaufort has a, a rowing club. And so, this past weekend, they bought down the rowing club and we got in the surf boat. And guess what? Them oars, they were 12 foot ice about two inches diameter to the handle up here. He said, we cannot, they cannot handle that surf boat in Taylor's Creek. He said, so I'm trying to commandeer some of my old friends and buddies I can count on to go, we're going to go row that, I think it was on Thursday, we're going to go row that boat. They're going to take some pictures and then they're going to take her to Portsmouth. That's where she is now, up in Portsmouth, up in their, uh, in, in their uh, life-saving station. So I said, I, right away, I said, Ara, I was not in the Coast Guard. He said, don't matter. It don't matter. I just need you. And I said, well, let me meet you to the crossroads. That's where 70 connects Harker's Island Road. I said, let me meet you there, and we'll go on. He said, no, I'll come pick you up. <laughs> uh, he said, I'll come pick you up. He was very opinionated. You never had he said, well, I'll come get you. You don't worry about getting a Beaufort. Uh so he did, and he had a guy in a car, uh, most of all know him, uh, Bobby Russell, was in a Coast Guard. He asked Bobby Russell, now Bobby's not in the picture, and I'll tell you the reason. Uh, this is Roy Willis from uh, Stacy Carver. This is Roy, this is Stacy Davis, a lot of people call him Bertram. He was in the crew. I'm right here with the White. This is Kenneth Whitehurst, he was in the Coast Guard. This is Bertram's son, Mac Vay. That you play basketball with, yeah. and right behind him, his younger son, Stacy. So we had to have six crew. We had to have a six to row uh, the boat. Uh, so we arrive, and of course, ours back here. And guess what? He's in his uniform. That black uniform is what he wore uh, when they did this exercise when he's in the Coast Guard. Now he was stationed most of his career up in Montauk. He's always told us. Uh, no telling how many times he's painted that lighthouse. Because uh, Ari had a nickname, fishermen called him Scrub Brush. Because when he came ashore, everything was done, you know, when they got done fishing. Uh, so Pam, go to the one at where we're rowing here. I'm, some interesting things happened out there in the water. This is okay. Either, that was okay. Yeah, yeah, that was okay. Okay, here we are. They just we just left the dock. Now, you see, the little, little oars or did you get 
There are the 12 foot oars. They made them, the, the uh, maritime, maritime Museum made them. They're ice oars. They're 12 foot long. I was in the stern of the boat right here, and he's doing all the steering. You don't worry about steering. And once in a while, we get in, we get in sync. See how we're con <laughs> see how we're together. Once in a while, we we did it right. And the thing about rowing, uh, I learned a lot of stuff that hour out there in the water. A lot of a lot of things about rowing is uh, being coordinated. And so you're setting back to the bow, so you don't know where you're going. And you, the, what they call the cox one is what Iris called. He's giving you commands. And he don't say row, row, or anything like that. He just tells you port side, oars in, or just to say, or he just said row. Okay? Uh, the oars, the dimension of those oars are very critical in how they handle. Because there's a distance from your hand to that row lock with the total length of the oar is very important. If that is right, it is very easy to move. I was surprised how easy it was to move that 12-foot oar because that dimension was pretty accurate, yeah. okay? So it's easier than what it looks, you know. Now, I can't imagine rowing out into the surf, and we'll talk about some shipwrecks uh, where men actually rowed out in that surf to Cape Lookout, eight men instead of six. So we, got, we, had, we only had six. They had eight men who rowed that same type vessel out into the ocean. Uh, so watch, you're, you're sitting here like this, and your person is sitting right here. In my case, it was Stacy. And so R said, you watch his hands. You do what he does. And the people behind us do what they did what I did. The row behind me. So if Heber messes up, it's supposed to be three other or two more mess up. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's how it's supposed to work. And if you had eight, it would be three more. If three more messes up. So it's you two right here, and getting aboard the boat, I had I I would have gotten a bow if I didn't know that. You know what I mean? Because I'm good at messing stuff up. I tell people I was a major in the military. They say, you were? I said, yeah, I was a major mess, uh, mess up. <laughs> but it was real critical, and you, you could feel that boat moving when everybody was together. You could really feel the boat pick up speed. Now, we went a little bit more than what you saw in the video there. It was rough that day, southwester. You know how it is along the waterfront. But Ara had everything under control. He could move that boat in a circle. It didn't matter. He could do it all right back there with that long oar. Uh, there's no rudder goes through the bottom of the boat or anything. They're basically flat bottom. They're real good in the surf. Of course, that's that's what they that's what they were, uh, were made to do. Of course. Uh, so I'll go back to my neighbor, uh, Reginald Lewis. Uh, go to this picture of the 30 foot of there. We love the 30 foot uh, boat over there. Uh, this is what they had to keep look at when I was back in the 60s. Uh, the first vessels were wood, or wood construction, very little fiberglass on them, and later on they become fiberglass hulls. And my friend always told me, Heber, the first two or three numbers is the length of the vessel. When you see that number, you know that's a 30-footer. Just that simple. Very easy. I've always remembered that. Now, the one to the Cape was 30452. I always remember that number. That was her number. One to Cape Look at. They had a single 671 diesel. Everybody's familiar with a diesel engine, what they were supposed to do during the war, and they're still using the day. Uh, I had some friends yesterday talking about it. He said, Heber, the problem with them is they leak oil so bad. It's not that they don't run good anymore, it's the oil issue. And it gets in the bilge, and guess what? When you pump your boat out, the oil goes out in the water. He said, That's, That was the downfall of that particular motor, uh, the 671. Uh, they were real fast, and back in the 60s, we didn't have many fast boats uh, around Harkers Island. Uh, a lot of inboard boats, but they did not run as fast as the Coast Guard boat. Uh, we called it the cutter, but she was smaller than a cutter. We always said the Coast Guard cutter. Uh, you knew when you saw her coming, you knew uh, the bow had a, what we call a little turn up to the bow. So it, once you give it power, it was, it was idle on the plane right away. Okay? And it had spray rails on it, and so when the water come up the side of it, you had a beautiful spray right out front. So you could see that boat a couple of miles away. You knew it was a Coast Guard cutter. Uh, at the time, they would dock at Shell Point. Uh, if you all been to Harkers Island, right across from, right out there in that parking lot was where they came in. Uh, Miss Harker, she owned that property. 
It was Harker's Motor Lodge or Fishing Lodge. And so there's a little basin there just for the Coast Guard. Of course, Bass Supermarket was there. That's where they did their grocery shopping. And that's where the men came to get off and on uh, the uh, boat there. Uh, so that's why I, and most of the time they had, a, uh, they had a Coast Guardman standing up front to that pole there. I thought that really looked good coming down the sign. He's standing up right, you know, and the boat, it was, you know, just beautiful. And of course they had an American flag on the, on the stern of it. Uh, but that brings back a lot of memories that uh, particular boat. I think they were made up in New England. The hull, we didn't make them. I don't think we made them down in North Carolina. I think they were made up in New England, that particular uh, boat there. Uh, the Coast Guard station, uh, the station was built over here to Cape Lookout in 1916, uh, a year after they merged, 1915, they merged uh, all the branches. Uh, they did this work, life saving service, all merged together in uh, 1915. But the station was built in 1916. It is in very good shape even today. Uh, they have, it's well maintained. I do what Chris did on the Cape, I take tours out there. So some days I get to ride by it 10 or 12 times. And we stop, we talk, and, you know, tell yarns about it and uh, things that happen over there. A very good shape. It's always been up on a hill. And uh, I've read that the uh, life-saving station was built, uh, was actually standing right beside it. They moved it over about 80 feet so they could build a station. So it was in a very good location. Uh, right now, uh, because the pine trees are so high, it's hard to see out across the ocean, but when it was built, it was in an ideal place uh, to look out over, especially the shoals. Uh, everything has to do, uh, I to with those shoals out there. That's where the shipwrecks are. And so the building is facing south. You walk out the front door, if the trees weren't there, you would be looking right at the shoals. So anything happened out there, if you were on watch, and we'll talk about that with the Rawson when he tells that story. If you were on watch, you pretty much knew where those ships were. Uh, especially if the sails were dying, you pretty much knew she was on those shoals because you knew where those shoals were. Uh, the Coast Guard, uh, I was a Mr. Chile earlier uh, a few minutes ago. I, I, I don't know the percentage, but it's got to be 20, 25 percent. Uh, when I grew up, young boys joined the Coast Guard. Uh, very few, um, uh, one or two went in the uh, Air Force. Uh, but the majority of the, my friends uh, joined the Coast Guard. Well, it was the water. They grew up on the water. Why not see more of it? Why not let somebody else pay for the fuel? And you're, <laughs> you're running around enjoying your day, you know. A uh, uh, quick story about the, uh, the surfer. I already told me this years ago. They used to have competitions. And I have seen uh, one of our old newspapers. They had one here to Fort Macon one year. But I already talked about the one they had up in New York. Uh, where he was and of course it's colder up in New York so they get in, uh, they get, get a chance to train much during the winter months but the boys down here in Fort Macon did and so they met in the spring and our at Reson, I talked about Reson, uh J.D. Lewis some of those old timers I remember them all they were they were on the team here from Fort Macon and so they show up well, they're all talking to each other and our asked Reson said, how long have you all been practicing any? And Reginald said, Ara, we have been in that boat two or three hours every day since April. Since the weather broke a little bit warm, we have been in that surf boat every day two or three hours. Well, Ara said, well, we've been in her. <laughs> we've been in her about five times the whole year. Uh, part of the competition when the gun went off, you had to row out a certain distance, and you had to capsize that boat. They were self-bailing, but you had to sink her. You had to flip her over, get her back upright, get the water out of her, and come back to the dock. That was, that was the drill. And so R said they were all tied together. He said, we were beside Fort Macon. You know, they got their oars ready. And R said, when that gun went off, when he looked, when he looked there, they were already about a fourth of boat length ahead from when the gun went off. <laughs> so he said, needless to say, who won the event? <laughs> you know, they were out there, did their drill, and they came back uh, very quickly. Uh, they took pride in that. Uh, those men's arms was, I mean, you don't know, right in here. Popeye. 
Yeah. Every one of them. Every one of them. Uh, so that's some things that, uh, that they did. Uh, of course, now the Coast Guard has changed a lot. Uh, when I grew up, Coast Guard would actually rescue you. We depended on it. We relied on it. We knew they were right there to Fort Macon. I mean, uh, Cape Lookout. They could see the Harkers Island. They could see the hook of the Cape. They could see Corsan. We were just we just felt so safe knowing they were right there. Well, in 1982, they decommissioned it and it moved everything here to Fort Macon. So you know, we all got worried. Should we should we go to the Cape today? My motor's not running that well. We ain't got nobody to me in. And of course, as you see now, private enterprise has took that job over. Uh, is the Coast Guard under uh, what's uh, under a different department? At Homeland Security. Okay, they're under a different department now. And so they're responsible for drugs. I see a lot of stuff in drugs, especially in uh, the Gulf and the Straits of uh, Florida there, you know, drugs coming across in our country. So the roles have changed a lot, uh, you know, what, what it used to be. Uh, there is a kid in our church, has joined the Coast Guard. He'll probably be the newest uh, recruit. He's already up to Cape May. So I was happy for him. Uh, to do that. So there's still boys interested uh, in joining uh, the Coast Guard. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Well, just, okay. One, yes, ma'am. Yeah, please, please, and that's good to everybody. Please interrupt and add to our talk as we go, please. The way that that surf boat sounds like it was constructed is kind of like a dory. Yeah. Which is a boat that was used on the river up in West Virginia. So and up in the Ohio River and all that. So is this basically a door? Uh, there, there are lap streak. Yeah. There was all the planks uh -huh. run this way, and they lap over about this far. Uh -huh. uh, another one they built, I believe they used juniper, but it's real thin. Oh, okay. It's only like a half inch thick because they had to keep them light. Mm -hmm. And after they get her built, then they go inside and they put oak ribs mm -hmm. all through the hull. They're very strong boats, believe it or not. Yeah. I've never built a boat like that. Everything I've always built has been what's called hard chime. Uh -huh. But they are very tough boats. Okay. But it's basically the same. Yeah. Thing. And see, both ends are turned up. Yeah, there's a point on each end. Yeah, the both ends are turned up. They come to a point. Hard to tell. The, uh, well, you can because of the steering station. But if that weren't there, you couldn't tell the difference mm -hmm. from the bow. So they work very good in the sea. Mm -hmm. You know. That sounds good. And then I, the ones, the dories that I'm thinking about were on the river. Um, and there's actually still a place that you can do it as a tourist thing. Most of the river running is on those, you know, inflatable boats. The yeah. Zodiac kind. But they, there is a place that I know yeah. of um, that still does dory rides. If yeah. You mean. Yeah. I know in Australia, I, I love that kind of, uh, Australia, they have competition. Uh -huh. uh, they, they row out in the ocean. But these boats are fiberglass. And really the worst part sometimes is getting back in. Mm -hmm. Because as the boat comes in, if you have, don't have your weight just right, she'll want, to, she'll want to do this. And then she's going to go one way or the other. And she's not going to tell you until after it's over Until after you're overboard, mm -hmm. she'll say, I told you I was going to go to the port. That's you thought I was going to starboard. Yeah. yeah, that's how that works. I know about fat blind skis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I might. I thought at one time we had a station to sea level, did we? Coast Guard station by the hospital. Atlantic. Atlantic. Okay. Okay. Uh, is your station at Ocracoke anymore? No. I mean the buildings there, right? They have a presence. They do have a presence. They keep oh, do they? Yeah. Okay. Um, but they do keep vessels there. Yeah. Tied up at the yeah. Which is the North Carolina Association for the Advancement of Teaching. Yes. Yeah. Sure, that was. Man, you've done time. good, but I get that out when, when we. <laughs> I got. Uh, Thank uh, you for the question. Uh, I got a couple things. You can keep it. Uh, I was, as you were talking about your West Virginia dories there, uh, we were up in, uh, in this little hey, sidebar here. Can I interrupt you? Could, could you stand up, please? What? Stand up and. Oh, okay, I can stand up. 
Um, but we were over in uh, the Watauga River, around mm -hmm. Boone there, and you go up and anyway, and the guy was running short of short of uh, of guides. So uh, he, they were, I heard him over there talking to guys that were guiding, and and I, and I said, uh, I can, I can run that boat if you want me to. <laughs> he said, You can. I said, I, I'm from Harker's Island. I'll be okay. So he set me loose in that boat. I beat every one of them down that river. I was, it was like a competition, then. I was ready to row it in anyway. Yeah. And and I was thinking about this too, Mr. Uh, uh, Todd Nelson, that was supposed to be here today. And I wanted to share this with you because he's just amazing. First of all. His grandmama and my grandmother were grandmothers. No, they were sisters and grandmothers. <laughs> they were, see, I thought y'all, I, I was just making sure y'all y'all were awake. They were grandmothers, but they were sisters, so we're kin. But he shared with me one time, which was amazing to me, that after 9-11, he was, he was active at 9-11, and, and right after 9-11 took place, he was called in because he was high up. I don't know what he was in the Coast Guard, but he was like real high. And he was called in to meet with President Bush at the time, the second Bush, and all the folks in the in the White House, in the like the it's not the war room now, but you know what I'm talking about, to talk about homeland security. How cool is that? A guy from Harker's Island meeting with the president and talking about our homeland security back in two thousand one. But anyway, that's pretty good. Um the uh, oh, the third thing I see I was trying to keep my list there when you were talking. My third thing, I got a little R. A. Lewis story here. Ari and Daddy were fishing one day, and and when I, Ari loved to catch speckled trout, so did my daddy. So they were both fishing it one day, and they you hook the bluefish. And if you know about if you're speckled trout fishing, with whatever little wiggly worms, and you hook bluefish, a lot of times they'll tear them tails off. You know. Well, he was trying to get that bluefish off, and the bluefish bit him on the finger. And you know, bluefish, I, I call them saltwater piranha. You know, they bit him on the finger. Well, Ari didn't say a word. He took that fish and beat him right in the belly. <laughs> and throwed him overboard, he said, you won't bite another person today. <laughs> so that kind of gives you a, the mental capacity of Ari Lewis. Tough as nailed, I'm telling you. Now. The other thing, and I may, have to, I may have to sit down with this because we mentioned about the Chrissy Wright. And, um, and in my, maybe I can hold this and hold my book too. But I, I just wanted to share a little bit. Any, any, Anybody familiar, when I say to Chrissy Wright, you know, there's a Chrissy Wright Lodge down east and there's stuff here. But uh, I wanted to kind of, and I, I, I know it's, I'm not usually not good at reading to people, but we're going to try this anyway. To, to, but um, <clears throat> less than a mile up the beach, and it's Sonny wrote these, and, and it, uh, like I said, it goes, it gets into some of the actual verbiage of the people that were around that day, and it kind of mentions of some of the stuff you were talking about there as far as... Uh, you know, the, the people that saved the folks on the boat and what happened. But you know how they always put a, a, a stoplight at the intersection after the wreck, you know, to make it safer? Well, the Chrissy Wright was kind of like our wreck at the stoplight that caused the United States Life Saving Service to be put at Cape Lookout. So, so with that said, I'll, I'll read here. Less than a mile of the beach and only a few yards offshore is the site of the wreck of the schooner Chrissy Wright. Now, we're doing that story, and this is on Shackford. We would be telling this during our tour. This wreck was probably the most gruesome and certainly one of the most important to take place in these waters. They were making for the shelter of Cape Lookout when they struck a shoal. The temperatures quickly dropped from in the 50s to 8 degrees. 8 degrees. And this was in January. So this was, and this was the writing, oh, well, I'll read. The following is a quote from the Wilmington Morning Star. I think they're still available, matter of fact, the Wilmington Morning Star, the Wilmington Star. Uh, on Thursday, January 14th, 1886. So this is out of the Wilmington Star. The vessel went ashore Friday night, six miles west of Cape Lookout Light. The steward was swept away soon, as the, soon after the vessel struck. One sailor was drowned in an attempt to get ashore. Another was knocked overboard and lost on Sunday. The captain and mate froze to death on Sunday and one sailor on Sunday night. At 8 o'clock, another sailor and only one of the crew left was rescued at 10 o'clock by, by a crew of natives. Natives, that's what they called us. <laughs> the steamer Nellie B. Day, D-E-Y, is that Day? Die, thank you. Nellie B. Dye of Beaufort, Captain Dudley, brought off the three frozen men. The rescued man was named Charles Tate, T-A-Y-T. Is that Tate? We'll call it that anyway. All right. 
So that was out of the uh, Wilmington Star. And then I wanted to uh, share this with you because uh, this is called The Ballad of the Chrissy Wright. And it's got the history in it, but Sonny wrote it to a, you might say, a poem type story. And I'm going to try to read it best I can like Sonny would read it here. Stranger things transpired near Cape Lookout Bar. Most of worse were uh, we were have ha that most the worst we have found was the cold, cold night when the Chrissy Wright run hard and fast aground. Thomas Clark, you see, was from New Jersey in the shadows of New York town. Young Tom left there. He would sometimes swear to travel the whole world round from Baltimore to Savannah with a load of G-U-A-N-O? Guano. What is that? Bird. Oh, okay, good. Bird. Sorry. Bird. I didn't know that. All right. Well, they used it to build ex or to make explosives also. But it's chemical. All right. Thing. They were grossing a warm, calm sea. All were going quite well when the bar barometer fell, uh, more like January ought to be. Uh, during a southwest gale, while f under full sail, the Chrissy Wright plowed into shore. The rudder was gone. All the sails were torn. Their chances of survival were poor. As the first light shone, they were all alone, around on a windswept shore. The ice-covered mask and eerie shadow did cast. The Chrissy Wright would sail no more. Just up the beach, where they could not reach, the Shackford bankers stood by. It had started to freeze down to eight degrees, the rescue they could not even try. Instead, a fire was built and the whole sky lit to comfort the surviving few. The winds that they blew and the sea foam flew, no help uh, for the uh, forlorn crew. Now, a little sidebar here, but Charles Tate was the only guy who was, uh, who was rescued said that that fire burning along the beach was probably the worst thing they could have done <laughs> because they were on the boat freezing to death while the time the natives, we'll call them that, was on the beach with the fire going to let them know that they were still there. But again, what a, what a torment, you know, if you think about it. So, all right. Two nights they stayed until the wind did lay and the Nellie B. die ventured out over the bar they went to hell they were bent all fishermen all brave and all stout they laid to the lee prepared for the rescue to be captain dudley and the crew uh, he had chosen only one was alive in the shrouds he was tied captain clark plus two lay frozen the survivor charles tate out of new york state alone lived to tell the tale of the fearful night near cape lookout bite and a schooner under sail. The burying grounds got three. Three went to the sea, but at rest they'll, they'll never be. For this sad tale with a soul has to be retold as long as there are sailors and the sea. Dreadful happenings transpire near Cape Lookout Bight, but the damnest we have ever, uh, has ever been found was the dark, cold night when the Chrissy Wright run hard and fast aground. That was Captain Sunny there. Very good. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to you. <laughs> uh, the Christy. She started. She started. She's gonna make you stand up. She started something now. You started something. Right. She started something now. Uh, back in about 2007, 2008, there was a rescue. Uh, I they actually found her. The Christy Wright. She's about six foot. But, or it's a shipwreck in that vicinity, and they feel like it is her. Uh, she's about six foot deep. And uh, there's a cemetery over the Shackford Banks, and I always heard she was very close, only on the ocean side, and really she is if you look at the, where they find her. So that, that's kind of a weird tool. So where they died right ashore was a cemetery, the community cemetery. Uh, Okay. What do you want to talk about now? What do you want to talk about now? <laughs> well, that's the World War II stuff. 
right, I'm going to go uh, doing my tour uh, <coughs> out there on the Cape when I get to the uh, Coast Guard station. I'll back the truck around so you can see over the side, what we call the side beach. Uh, used to, we could drive out there, uh, drive over to Sand Dune and going out to Cape Point. But now so much ero erosion has happened, it's very dangerous uh, to do that. So I'll generally stop. We can see the Coast Guard station, and right behind us is the beach. Now, actually, you don't see the sand dunes, but there is a cedar tree there that's pretty much uh, I use as a sort of a guide uh, when I talk about World War II. Uh, World War II, our nation, our, all these states inland from us was pretty much far away from the war. Did had no idea what was going on along the coast of North Carolina and Virginia. And the reason I say that, uh, the Gulf Stream is only about 40 miles off our coast. So the Army, Navy, and the Merchant Marines used that Gulf Stream. Remember, it comes south, comes right by us, turns, and goes right back around the Atlantic Ocean. That's how our, I, I really believe that's how our explorers got here. It weren't so much as sailing. Have you seen their sailboat square? I mean, how did they get anywhere? Uh, it was current. It was a lot of current bought them here right by us. They had to see us. So they used that uh, current uh, during World War II to help move. They're very slow. Those cargo ships are very slow. And a lot of them came from side from Aruba with oil that would go up to New York with kerosene, have it refined. So you had a lot of traffic right <coughs> off of our coast here. Uh, well, guess what? Adolf Hitler knew about this too. And so he assigned submarines to come out uh, in our waters and try to sink as many ships as they could. I've heard like 41 or two was sent the very first month of the war. Uh, the only good thing, if it was a good thing about U-boats, they could not stay submerged very long because they had to service to charge batteries. Uh, so the Coast Guard was the Cape Lookout. Remember the building was built in 1916? They were there. The Army was there. There's a small group of uh, uh, Navy personnel there, and they were experimenting with radar and stuff. Remember, we didn't have uh, GPS stuff like we had now. All that was just coming along. So the Coast Guard, uh, I'll get to the Army. The Army's job, they had two six-inch guns. They were sitting in the sand dunes. We used to call them the gun mats. For, we used to call it the gun mats. Uh, they were the third row in from the ocean. Now they are in the ocean. If you're lucky low tide, you might see the roof of one of the bunkers. That's how much erosion has happened since about 1980 is when that started. And I had somebody ask me one time on my tour, they said, why did they move them out there? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, got it right. Just about right. Yeah, you don't know. So, so uh, anyway, uh, they had a range of about 10 miles, so they were put there to protect Barden's Inlet, very close to the Cape, and, of course, Beaufort Inlet. Uh, we were afraid the, uh, the Germans would get and make landfall, you know, here on our beaches. They're also off of the rock jetty, I've been told there's a submarine net went out about, uh, about a mile out into the ocean. So if they caught tangling that, that would stop them uh, from getting ashore here. So that's what the Army did uh, when, during the war. Now, the Coast Guard's job, uh, they would patrol the beaches, walking sometimes on horseback. I don't know if the Cape used horses. I have seen photographs of horses, but I do know they walked a lot, and they will walk so far and so I would leave them until they got the whole area uh, pretty much covered. I added a little bit. Go ahead. They, uh, you don't go too far because I'm not going to. But they said when they walked, and some of y'all may know, but they had a coin. Have you ever heard that? Where they, so like one station would start walking and the other station that, that would be down the way because they were, you know, spread out. Like I said, they're to Portsmouth and somebody said off of Atlantic. It was, so these life-saving service, they would walk. And so what they would do is when they met the other people, because, you know, when you got out of sight of the, you know, the, the, the boss man, you yeah. might not walk all the way. That's right. <laughs> so they had a coin that they would trade with the person coming from the other station to prove that they actually walked and covered the whole beach yeah. and met each other. Don't that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Or if they were on horseback. What was that? It was called a badge and it had their number, number. Yeah. She's smart about that. And the, uh, now, I've heard it was some type of clock, too, was out there. Yeah. At that post. With the key post. Yeah. Oh, really? When you yeah. got to that post, there's a clock that you had to do something you had to, to prove. You the clock and punch, and there was a paper uh, dial in there. Yeah. Mark the time, and you took that clock back, and it could only be owned by the captain of the station. Yeah. Which was yeah. proved that you had to uh, keep everybody honest. 
So that was their that was their job, and uh, but mostly what they did do. I've heard stories of uh, they find bodies that had got killed off of the in the ocean and had drifted to the beaches, mm-hmm. and I always wonder what did they do with that body until they could get it somewhere. And uh, there is some concrete, uh, is there concrete footing over there to the Cape, and is there old fart stains for there? And somebody told me that was an incinerator. So did they burn the bodies if they were too far? I mean, I don't know. Nobody's ever told me what they did. You can imagine if they'd been in the ocean a couple of days, what you had there, that was bad. The war was very close. Yep. Uh, my grandparents had told me, and grandparents too, they were living during the war. They had what they call a blackout down these, no lights after dark. Uh, your headlight had to be covered up with like half of it you could only use. Uh, sort of things like that. Uh, they've also told me uh, sometimes explosions out in the ocean will rattle the windows. Sometimes they could see the smoke. Uh, uh, there is a map, uh, I think like 500 shipwrecks along our coast. It's pretty neat. It's got a lot of those uh, shipwrecks. Uh, two that I'm familiar with because my uh, friends used to take people out there fishing is uh, the Papoose and the Atlas Tanker. I've always heard of them too. Matter of fact, there's a lady home named her dog Atlas Tanker. I, I said, honey, that's the best name you could give a dog. <laughs> I love that name. I'll never forget Atlas. But the Atlas Tanker is, uh, should, they're not very far, and especially if you're trying to catch grouper and those type fish, they're excellent for uh, fishing. When uh, did that ship sink, the Atlas Tanker? I don't know what year, man. It was during the wartime. During the Second War. Yeah, during the Second War. Oh, okay. so yeah. 41, 42. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. called oh. the Atlas Tanker. Uh, How many? I've heard about 60 in all. Uh, it's just off of our coast here. The, the little stuff that Sonny did, that's a good question. It said the first six months, I know you said yeah. three, the first six months of the war, that it was over 70 ships sunk. There you the go. The first six months. Yeah. So you're looking at what, De- uh, December 7th, 1941, yeah. date lifted against me. So yeah. January to July, if you look at that, it was 70. Plus ship for some yep. of and I've seen like 5,000 people uh, die just in our, some of the fiercest naval battles actually were right here, right off our coast here. Uh, now the Coast Guard, you can call it skill or lucky, but the Coast Guard did sink a submarine about 20 miles. I think our number was U-352. They had that number. I think our number was U-352. Yeah. If you've ever been to the uh, Pine Hill Shores Aquarium, the big tank, that's what you're looking at, is a replica of that submarine. She's listing like this, just exactly the way the one is out, out on the ocean. Uh, George Purifoy, right down here, he passed away years ago, but I think his son still has this diving company down here. They've got a lot of relics off of that submarine. I know he's got the gun, a lot of dishes and stuff. They did a lot of diving on her early, you know. I don't think they might still dive on her. I've heard the kind of phrase she might fall, so don't know uh, about that. They had units too. The uh, crew from uh, Germany came over here. Yeah, 1942 that happened. In 1992, that's 50 years later, they did meet here. Uh, the crew, the uh, sub held about 44 men. Uh, of course, by then, some of them had passed away. And of course, our question was, did you ever get close enough, you know, to our soil here? Did you ever, and nobody would make any kind of remark on it. But there is stories, a couple stories, that on the Cape Lookout, there was a sailor, a, a, a German sailor, was found, and in his pocket was a ticket to the Beaufort Theater. <laughs> there has been reports of newspapers they find on these bodies that came from Carteret County. Uh, my brother-in-law lived in, in Davis. That's about 10, 12 miles north of uh, Shell Point. And he used to tell me summer months, sometimes young boys would come in. All they wanted was a couple gallons of gas. They said our gas tanks did not look like ours. And they would vanish and never see them anymore. So you, we never know. So this and is I've heard. In wartime, they would show up. You know, these, yeah. Look, you th- think about it, and then I've, I've told that story too because you've shared it with me. But you think about Davis Shore now in 42. It's not a big metropolis now. You, can you imagine what it looked like in 1942? Yeah. So when a strange young fella showed up at Davis, nobody knew him. Ding, 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 
Yeah. There's a good yep. possibility he might be from off, like way off. Yeah. Yep. Not necessarily. They just had an army camp. Well, that's true. I, I have an army yep. camp road was there, so there yep. was encampment and there was radar. But how about experimentations, all sorts of things. But if yeah. this if this strange looking white guy showed up and speaking with some foreign language, that yeah. may be a <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, all right, go ahead. So anyway, that's that's some uh, stories uh, that we uh, uh, tell out there on the Cape. Uh, yeah, the war was very uh, uh, a lot of activity right here on our coast. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we got smart about it. Planes could spot them. And so things kind of changed around uh, as the war uh, went on. Uh, I know from a personal account, my father-in-law, he, uh, he was on an oil tanker. He was in the Merchant Marines, and they weren't recognized really until later on uh, by being, you know, any kind of military uh, thing. But, you know, they were not protected either. And they were two days out of Aruba. Now, Aruba's out on the tip of South America. Uh, a lot of oil down there still is. And they had uh, kerosene. They, they was transporting up to New York was what they were doing. The Navy had the Navy and Coast Guard had given them a right to come, was pretty safe. But he said about the second day, uh, the submarine was on their stern and started shelling the ship. Did not shoot a torpedo or anything, but finally they had to abandon the ship because they you know were going to sink. And the ship sunk, and uh, they gathered two or three belongings. He bought home some souvenirs. Uh, he had a couple elephants. Uh, carved out of probably, uh, I tell you, it's, they're black, and it's black all the way through it. I believe it's some type of ivory that they're made out of. It's not wood. Uh, so he had experience during the war uh, about the submarines, and lucky they, none of the uh, crew were killed or anything. Their main thing was to get that ship on the bottom of the ocean to keep that oil from getting up here, uh, where a lot of it was. You ready? You ready? Yeah. <laughs> you got this guy. Absolutely. You, you talk and I think. And, yeah, that's right. and I talk and you think. We, we're a good team. Um, we talked about the, the graveyard of the Atlantic, and you mentioned about the number of ships. I don't know the number of ships, but the first recorded ship to be sunk was the Tiger. It was a British vessel called the Tiger, and it was the flagship of Sir Richard Greenville's fleet. And it was stranded off Ocracoke Inlet while attempting to reach Roanoke Island, which would be the you know, first English settlement here. And that was in June of 1585. So think about from 1585 to 2023. I think that's the year we're in, right? 12,000 years. You know. 12,000 years. Yeah, 12,000 years ago. <laughs> anyway, so that's a, that's a long time to be documenting shipwrecks along our, along our coast here. Um, this is one I just thought, as I was reading, kind of preparing for today, I thought this was kind of interesting. And this, this wreck happened uh, north around Portsmouth and uh, the, the Veracruz 7. Have you, anybody ever, ever heard of the Veracruz 7? All right, there you go. And I, it was a neat little history about it. And I, I want to, it's not too much here. I just want to read it to you. On Portsmouth Island, the far eastern end of the park, so we're doing the tour now, you kind of, kind of picture. So the far, you know, northeast uh, of, of, of the Cape Lookout National Seashore. On the morning of May 8, 1903, a large sailing vessel was spotted attempting to enter the inlet. I'd be scared today to go in with a 20-footer, much less a, the Veracruz. Veracruz, and I will share, was um, upon investigation, it proved to be the 605-ton um, brigantine Ver Veracruz VII, a Portuguese registry from Cape Verde Islands with 399 passengers, 22 crewmen, and assorted cargo, including 214 barrels of whale oil. While the vessel was grounded on Dry Shoal Point in Portsmouth, lifesavers went out to assist, uh, to their assistance and brought all the passengers to safety, making the total of 41 trips in their open surf boats. We just saw a picture of one of those. They... Uh, they cared for the villagers for four days, consuming four and a half barrels of flour before 416 of them were transferred to customs grounds in Newburn. The captain and mate took off before they were arrested, <laughs> and two of the crewmen remained with the ship, selling illegal rum to the locals. <laughs> 
until they were finally arrested. <laughs> they were all eventually taken to New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, their origina original destination. But 94 of the men and 12 women returned to Newburn area to work. After five generations, and this was written in about the 90s here, so it'd be a little bit longer. But after five generations, there could easily be several thousand descendants who could claim that their grandparents were aboard the ill-fated Vera Cruz 7. So the folks in Newburn, there's a lot of people probably can take, trace their lineage all the way to this shipwreck that happened along our coast. So I thought that was, that was pretty cool here. Um, Another one I want to share with you, and this is, uh, and I'll show you why here, but, and it's a more, more detailed, uh, it's the Sarah D.J. Rawson. Anybody ever heard of the Sarah D.J. See, uh, Sarah D.J. Rawson, and, I'm, and, I, and I always share this on my tour, because, and, and again, with, from 1585 to now, I mean, how many days you got? We could spend a lot of time talking about all of them. So we want to pick some of the ones, I, this is the ones that are, I think are interesting to me. So, and this is a more detailed account. So I want you to kind of listen to what was happening and what was going on and then, then things. And kind of picture, you know, that rowboat that you saw Ari and, and Mr. Heber and some of the folks in. And, you know, this is happening in February of 1905. February. Not a nice summer day with a southwest breeze in Taylor's Creek. So anyway, with that going on. Okay. The wreck of the Sarah D.J. Rawson. Although Keeper William H. Gaskell had been in charge of Cape Lookout Life Saving Station since its originally uh, commissioned in December of 1887, he nor any of the crew had ever been officially uh, decorated until, until after the wreck of the unprecedented rescue and unprecedented rescue of the crew of the Sarah D.J. Rawson. And he even has like the serial number, you know, number uh, 115910, 292 tons on February 9th, 1905. The three masted schooner departed Georgetown, South Carolina on February 2nd, 1905, bound for New York City with a load of yellow pine lumber valued at $3,000. The vessel was owned by T.D. French, home port Camden, Maine, was under command of Charles, Captain Charles Anderson of Sweden. Okay, crazy, yeah. With a crew of six, all from Europe. Um, they were Otto Lessman, the mate, Germany, Martin uh, Martison, he was the cook from Norway, Hans Anderson, seaman, he was from Sweden, John Myra, M Y H R E, Myri, seaman, Sweden, Peter Hamselson, Sweden, and Jacob Hansen. The uh, Rawson stranded without warning on the outer shoals about nine miles southeast of the station during a strong south-southeast gale with thick fog and heavy seas. Due to the lack of visibility, she was not discovered until 12.05 when she was first spotted by the keeper. The following is a complete narrative portion of Keeper William H. Gassel's original handwritten record report. See, I like this stuff which was prepared shortly after the incident. It, presents, it is presented here as written. At 12.05, the fog let up some what over the shoals, which had been very thick in the vicinity of all the aforenoon, and I was looking over the shoals with the glass and saw the spars of what had to be some topmast schooner. The foremast was already down and the main topsail broken off. We at once got out the lifeboats and arrived close to the wreck at 4 p.m. So 12.05, she was spotted. 4 p.m., they arrived at the wreck, okay? Which proved to be a three-masted schooner, Sarah D.J. Rawson, lumber laden from Georgetown, South Carolina, for New York, and stranded at 5.30 a.m. And one of the seamen was washed overboard soon after she stranded. She was well up in the shoals and completely surrounded by high and dangerous breakers which no boat could pass through. I always envisioned like this boat laden with lumber coming from Charleston, South Carolina. The seas just tossing to and fro and these here, I just pictured these like 10 and 12 foot two befores just flying yeah. everywhere. I mean, missiles. you can just, torpedoes. yeah, torpedoes and missiles just flying everywhere. After dropping uh, in several times, 
close as possible to find no way to reach her, I decided to drop off an anchor for the night, and should there be a possible chance at daylight to get the men, I would be on hand. So about sunset, I anchored and remained by through the night, uh, 10 a.m. At daylight, I again dropped in close to the schooner. The sea was high and no chance to get them in until near the middle of the day when we were succeed, succeeded by anchored, by anchored the boat and dropped close enough to the schooner to get an, a heaving line to them, which they bent around their bodies and jumped overboard. Uh, and as we hauled the boats, the hauled to the boat one at a time through the water, six all told. At this time, all masts were down and vessels pretty, pretty much all broken up. About two thirds of the port side of the schooner was all that was left of her, nothing but a pile of wreckage. Spars, spars and lumber um, all tangled together, which later drifted off. I returned to the station about 5 p.m., having been in boat near 28 hours without food or sleep. And the, and, the, and the shipwreck crew had no food or sleep since supper Wednesday. All was taken to station, furnished with warm supper and dry clothes. The following clothes were furnished by the WNRA, Women's National Relief Association. Hmm. Uh, a balance and balanced by me and crew to take six suits, trousers, four pairs, shoes, six pairs, hose, women's hose maybe? Hmm, interesting. Three pairs, oh, socks. Three pairs drawers, <laughs> two pairs undershirts, two, two overshirts, four handkerchiefs, six caps, six cardian jackets, seven articles mentioned above from box. That was from uh, the William, uh, or from William H. Gaskell. What was interesting about this, and he didn't share this in his report here, was the influenza was going through this crew at the time. The COVID-19 was not the first influenza, or, or first, uh, uh, what do you this call it? This was like during the yeah. Spanish flu. Yeah, this was during the Spanish flu, if you want to say that. So flu was going through. So not only was the crew out there for 28 hours, but they were out there 28 hours without sleep or food, with the flu and again you know when the call is given that we need to go rescue a ship you know then you just go and that's the, the motto of the i can't i can't remember of how it go. that's what it yeah yeah that's right you got to go but it don't say you got to come back you didn't like that motto. <laughs> yeah i knew it went that way i wasn't going to quote it right but yeah we got to go but you don't have to come back yeah so they were out there 28 hours. Think about it, though. Know, if this, if this life-saving service station was not there and those men had grounded six miles off of our Cape Point, one was washed overboard, you know, what would have happened to the boat, you know, I mean, all this time? I mean, so the life-saving station right there saved these six other men's souls that was on that boat there and, and came in. Yeah, and they were all from far away, so they wouldn't know the, the coastline or the fact that there was a dangerous shoals there maybe and I, I don't know that's a good point there but a lot of these folks that uh, that were professional seagoing men you know were were familiar that they knew they were in the graveyard of the atlantic mm -hmm. and, 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 another saying and, if you could see land you're going to run aground too yeah and especially off of north carolina you know north carolina and i taught history like i said and if you think about the development of north carolina to the north of us we have chesapeake bay nice deep water access to the south of us, we have Charleston, a nice deep water harbor coming in. North Carolina really doesn't have a nice deep water port. We talked about the Tiger coming into Portsmouth trying to go up the, to Roanoke Island. What a, I mean, it's hard enough now with a motorboat and GPS. Can you imagine, you know, with a sailing vessel and that's all you had was the power of the, you know, nature and the forces of the wind and, and air, you know, to get this boat that was probably not very shallow drafted you just come across the atlantic ocean in her and she round rounds bow or round underneath the bottom of her you know and, and anyway you, you kind of get the idea um the part of that and i won't uh because it's, it's long here but I, I did want to go to the uh, in recognition and i'll go toward the end here in recognition of their uh of heroic uh conduct exhibited on the 9th and 10th of february 1905 
the rescue uh, and rescue of the six men from the wreck of the schooner Sarah D.J. Rawson. The gold uh, life saving, saving medal was bestowed upon the following members of the United States Life Saving Service Keeper, Keeper William H. Gaskell, Surfman uh, Kilby Guthrie. I always wondered if that was the Kilby Guthrie that moved yeah. into like Promised Land, Kilby yeah. Guthrie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tyree Moore, John A. Guthrie, James W. Fulcher, John E. Kirkman, um, Capulet T. Jarvis. We don't have many Jarvises anymore. Joseph L. Lewis. And the reason I like to tell this story, because uh, the last guy who received the Gold Life Saving Medal of Honor was Walter M. Yeomans. <laughs> so I like to tell that. So, so, I, so he's a kin. He's a kinfolk. Yeah, he's a kinfolk. So that was the Sarah D.J. Ross, and I'd like to share that. Yes, ma'am. Did you say this was 1905? 1905. Uh, the uh, influenza pandemic was in 1918 to 1919. Okay. So well, they, they, were, they, they had, it might have started at the Cape. <laughs> but that, it, it is recorded that they all had the flu. At, at the, uh, and, and I kind of compare it to, that it was about that, because I know it was during World War I, we were also fighting, you know, the Germans for the first time in the, the Axis powers, but, and, and the flu at that time as a nation. So it, you, you're abs absolutely right, around the 1915 and 1918, but, you know, you can still catch the flu, I guess, and they, they all had influenza at that time in 1905, so, anyway. Chris, are you going to sing for us? Well, I brought it just to fill in if we have to. Oh, it's, it's time. We had to wind it up, actually. Uh, I got to, uh, just let me say this right quick. Go ahead. Uh, Cape Lookout, the Coast Guard. Uh, there was a lot of accidents. I say a lot. There was a, some men got killed over to Cape Lookout. Uh, I know in 1968 or 69, Jack Rogers, uh, Davis. He was your uncle. There you go. Jack lived right down the road uh, from where I was raised, so I knew his family, his boys. All that family was not very uh, far from us, so I knew Jack. Uh, Sandy Balloon, I'm not sure if he was still in the service, but he got killed in a little piper club. Uh, they used to land in planes on the beach to surf fish. And I guess as a rule, don't fly low, slow. So Sandy was flying low, slow. And when he pulled up, she stalled out, and uh, he got killed over there. I've been told uh, firsthand by a guy that was uh, to the Cape with this boy and the garage. If you're sort of to the west from the Coast Guard Station, a big, huge garage. It's got three huge doors, and the boy got killed there. One of those doors, it was not all the way up. And so when he grabbed the rope to pull it, it all turned loose. And before he could get out of the way, was that true? You heard that story? He got killed right there on the spot. And then, I'm not sure, I did, we didn't hear much about this. I remember one night, a guy, one of the Coast Guard boys got killed from Harker's Island going back to the Cape. We heard he hit one of the beacon lights. You heard that too? Okay. All right. So, it was, uh, it was a dangerous place. I mean, it still is. You know. All right. Yeah. So, uh, it was a dangerous place. Uh, you know, you've got to rely on equipment and... Uh, so you, everything is sand and it's soft and your water and changes. Uh, even now, the show uh, on the ferry, uh, we try to keep up with the show. So about every two weeks, we move a buoy over. And the next week, we put it back where it was. So that's always going on out there. Uh, I think the 4th of July, they counted like five boats in one spot was all the ground. Even CETA was the ground trying to get them off. <laughs> I mean, and like you said, it's going to take somebody to get killed. Uh, they, it was online to have it dressed in October. We heard now they might not do it this year. No. So here, here we are. Uh, our big ferry boats are very shallow draft, but even at low tide, you know, we've got the king tide going on. Sometimes they will hit bottom. They're not very careful uh, going through there, but that's just the way. When I grew up, there's a straight line from Shell Point all the way to the Cape with one straight shot. You could look, you could look at one beacon and you couldn't see the one behind it. It was so straight. And over time, it's just kept doing this. Seemed like it's going to the western. The show was going that way, you know. And hurricanes don't help either. We have what we call the bird show. That's almost gone. Uh, Florence really did a number on that. 
And all that sand that was on that hill is in that water now. So you got all kinds of things uh, happening out there uh, with sand and moving. It's just the nature of, it's just a living earth. It is. It don't, it don't, it don't take a break. You know, it never stops doing stuff. And we really hadn't talked about storms because the, the 33 storm is what washed out Barden's Inlets because Chapman yeah. Banks and South Cor Cor Banks was connected. So if you think about the natural effect of yeah, she the wants her, of the She wants her island, island back. She wants to close it up. Yeah, she wants it back. That's the problem. Uh, Fred, uh, Fred Gillikin during the 33 storm. Fred Gillikin uh, was from Marshall Bird. Uh, he lived to be over 100. At one time, uh, he was probably the oldest Coast Guardsman like Ara was. Uh, I've heard the night, the day before the storm, uh, a lot of people didn't know like we do now about storms, but Fred had a little bit of knowledge and, you know, about being in the Coast Guard and knew some things. So he invited, I heard the story, he invited everybody on Cape Lookout to come get in the station, you know, to be in that big station where it's safer. And about 10 o'clock that night, the uh, wind uh, gauge, you know, had little cups on it. I heard a story 111 miles an hour. It was blowing then to the Cape. And the eye of the storm actually was north of us, up in, towards Okecote. So we weren't even near the eye of the storm. And I've heard the story the next morning when I looking around, and actually the building has slipped about three inches off of its foundation uh, during that night. So, uh, yeah, a lot of... A lot of uh, Things went on out there to the Cape. So what are we going to do now? Well, I got to set it up first. Let me you go want to tell you how this got started? No. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. We, anybody ever heard of the Boo Oh, yeah. It's not a shipwreck. So it's, yeah. uh, well, we, we, we are good. I thought we were like a juniper plug. We just kind of <laughs> fill in the hole every now and then. And if you get a swell, yep. it might swell up a little yep. bit. But, but with that said, uh, hey, gotcha. we were on the ferry the other day coming back. We had some, we had some teachers over to the Cape doing a, uh, some teacher workshop. This was uh, last it was last week. We Monday, yeah. Monday, Monday Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And we had told them about the, the booze yacht. And if you haven't heard the story. Anybody heard the story before? Yeah. All right. So we won't, we won't even go in that there. Well, the booze yacht, you know, the story is one thing. And then there's a song with the booze yacht. And... Uh, for some reason, he and I got singing it on the boat. And as a matter of fact, the, the boat didn't even leave the dock. No, he stayed right there. He stayed right there in the dock until we, all, we sung all the verses. Got a law come, guys. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so so I went home, and I, I told Mr. Haver when we were talking on the phone, I said, I went home and picked it out on the, on the guitar. So the next time, so if you don't mind, this is our first attempt with a guitar. We'd like to share it with you. And then it might be worth the two hours or the hour that you've been in here plus. Man, it's an hour and eight minutes. Yeah. We're flying. Yeah. So, I, we're going to sit down? You said, I, I got to, but I didn't bring my strap. So, you got to. So you got the words to it? I do. And you're going to have to hold it. <laughs> I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to. Uh, this version of this, I find out on YouTube, uh, yeah, and, and there's and a version that leaves out a lot of the verses. So, this is one that. Uh, so, uh, let me and just so I'm assuming the booze yacht is what it sounds like. The booze yacht, see, you're the only one here who don't know about the booze okay. yacht. So, it is the booze yacht was uh, during Prohibition, there was a, a the, and you'll hear it here in the song, the Adventure was the name of the boat, and they were, they were thinking that the uh, Coast Guard, it'd be Coast Guard at the yep. time, right? The Coast Guard, because this would be in the 20s, the Coast Guard was getting a little close, mm -hmm. so they decided they would throw their liquor overboard mm -hmm. and come back and get it later. Mm -hmm. Well, then that morning, the fishermen went out there, probably looking for mullets running on the shore, and they thought they saw some mullets out there, so they run their net out, and when they pulled it up, it wasn't mullets, it was full of liquor. Uh -huh. And you kind of can, we'll, can we'll, let the, we'll let the song tell the rest of the story. Uh -huh. How's that? I mean, I'm mean, gonna do it just like this. But That's what I'm thinking. Don't do the first, but the one time. Yeah, just like or the court, yeah. Right. <clears throat> you gonna start right here, right? Yeah. Okay, wait. Dad, dad. Down up, down, 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 down around the beehive, Parker's Island retreat. Every night and morning, the fisherman would be. One day there came a rounder, a rushing by the door. Say, boys, let's go to Game Cloud. There's a blue shot run. Shore. Oh, sorry. This way, that way, to the Cape they run. The coming of the adventure, but 
good fishing on the bum. Some folks lost their religion and backslid by the score. The king lost stoppers, they stood ace high when the blue shot run ashore. Things have changed since those times, and some are up in cheese, while others they are down and out, but most feel just like me. Some would part with all they have, and some a little bit more, to see another time like that when the booyah run ashore. Have we finished it all? Yeah. Oh, we've yeah. All right. This way, that way, to the cape they run. The coming of the adventure, put fishing on the bum. <laughs> Some folks lost their religion and backslid by the score. The king lost stoppers, they stood a high when the blue shot run ashore. played in a while, you can tell. Yeah. Uh, anyway, just Connie should have been up here playing. Yes, because. So that's the booze shot ballot. If we had to fill in any time, we were going to go with a sure thing. <laughs> now, you know what that crowd that ferry boat thought that day was singing that song. <laughs> so, uh, they thought we were crazy as a is what they thought. A question, then. The people that rescued the liquor, uh -huh. did they then I like that word, rescue. consume it, or did they pass it along? <laughs> to other people who might have wanted to Well, the story goes, it's like some of it was like buried up there and they said, don't tell nobody. <laughs> yeah. You know how that went, right? Yeah. Don't tell anybody. So the word just kind of spread like wildfire. So if you went up there and buried it, and I saw you buried it, guess what I did when you left? <laughs> yeah, you went up. I went behind it and dug it up. So I'm pretty sure I would love to find an old house somewhere on the island that somebody's like remodeling and when they pull out like an old piece of sheetrock or something, when them bottles stuck in the back, yeah. wouldn't that be great? Wayne Davis tells that when Ferry Dock moved, there's a house on the right that the man built him in the liquor city. So he was a boy, he called him over there and told him, he said, I built this house with the liquor from that and sold it. <laughs> <laughs> and now it is a uh, little house. Okay, right there right on Ferry Dock Road. Road. I know right where you're at. Yeah, I know right where you're at. He tells me, we ride around the aisle, he tells me all his stories. All those stories. That's when he's taking sisters. A lot of them, he changes. He changes. There is a, don't let the truth get in the way of a There is a, oh, I've heard this from several people. There is an old house on Harper's Island that I was told, inside, and I've been in the house, that inside the kitchen, the walls and the ceiling was made from lumber from a Christian, from a Christian right coming ashore. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, those bankers, when anything come on that beach, they, they grabbed it. it. That was their well, loads. I mean, yeah. That's well, how they got their lumber. Yeah, you said that. Uh, Nothing went to waste for these folks. People. There's, a story of, there's a story of one of the houses built to the Cape, and as they were doing some remodeling, uh, OG was carved in one, some of the yep. wood. OG. And they were like, what is that? Yep. And that was a... Uh, guy that was a member of the Coast Guard, his name was Otis Gaskell. And what they would do is they were walking down the beach when lumber would come ashore yep. from shipwrecks and stuff, <laughs> if they couldn't carry it back at that time, they would carve their name in it yep. and then carry it back to their house to do some remodeling or stuff. You got to think now, Lowe's was not that close by when you were yeah. yeah. <laughs> So OG was carved on there and that's what they assumed that he just cleaned that and